In the uh, 10 year span since the 9-11 attacks, more non-Muslims than ever have undertaken to learn about Islam to understand the religious motives of those who have declared war on, war on us. And yet we non-believers who are alarmed at what we have found in the foundational texts of Islam are always told by Islamists and their apologists that we don't understand the true Quran, that we labor under misconceptions about the religion of peace. Now, how's that? Better? Wow, okay, I'm going to put my lips right on it. Uh, we're always told that we don't understand the complexities of Sharia, that our objections and our criticisms are nothing more than racism, even though Islam is not a race. And of course, Islamophobia, an irrational fear of Islam and its adherents. The problem always seems to lie with us. And so the Islamists always keep us off balance through accusations and obfuscations and contradictions and mystification. One of the things we're all apparently confused about, except for Jimmy Carter, is the swelling tide of Jew hatred emanating from the triumphant Islamists throughout the Middle East in the wake of the farcically mislabeled Arab Spring. For example, an Egyptian cleric recently openly addressed Jews, Jews on behalf, he says, of 85 million Egyptians whose hearts beat with hatred for the Jews. These Jews are a cancer, he said, a catastrophe. There is not a catastrophe in the world that is not the handiwork of the Jews. They are a cancer in the body of planet Earth, and if permitted, it will spread and infect the entire body. Getting rid of these Jews is a must. Well, that seems like fairly straightforward Jew hatred to us unenlightened infidels. And, and yet we're told that Islam is a religion of interfaith tolerance, or that what we're mistaking for contemporary Islamic anti-Semitism is just a reaction to Israel's occupation and genocidal oppression of the Palestinians, or that it's not intrinsic to Islam but derives instead from the influence of Nazism, or that it's a perversion of Islam on the part of a tiny minority of extremists. So what are the true roots of Islamic Jew hatred? Well, Dr. Andrew Boston is here to tell us. An associate professor of medicine at Rhode Island Hospital, the major teaching affiliate of Brown University Medical School, He's the author of two essential, extraordinary, and meticulously documented works of scholarship, The Legacy of Jihad and The Legacy of Islamic Anti-Semitism, and of the upcoming book, Sharia versus Freedom. He's published articles and commentary on Islam on Front Page and in the Washington Times, National Review Online, Review Politique, American Thinker, and elsewhere, both in print and online. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm honored to present to you the man that the obfuscators don't want you to listen to, Andrew Boston. Thank you very much for that gracious introduction, Mark. And uh, a special thanks to Doris for all the work uh, that's gone into organizing uh, this talk and, uh, and, and the many events that uh, Doris organizes. Um, I, uh, I just wrote down for, for myself uh, four points of emphasis that I'd like to address uh, tonight. Um, uh, just briefly to talk about the inspiration for my first two books and how I segued from the initial compendium uh, to the second. Uh, I wanted to provide for you, uh, and that's the purpose of some of these, um, uh, these few PowerPoints I put together, uh, to give you some concrete illustrations of the major anti-Semitic motifs from uh, Islam's canonical text, in particular the Quran. Uh, by means of video clips, uh, memory segments, uh, Palestinian media watch segments, etc. Uh, they only last about 10 minutes. Uh, thirdly, I wanted to survey uh, how this uh, sacralized and unfortunately mainstream uh, Islamic hatred has resulted in chronic anti-Jewish persecution interspersed with paroxysms of mass violence against Jews living under Muslim rule across space and time and most importantly, what this living doctrine and history means for the modern era's collective Jew, i.e. Uh, Israel. And then I wanted to share with you a thought experiment that I performed, uh, which demonstrates how the Jewish intelligentsia in particular, uh, in particular remains willfully blind to the doctrinal and historical origins uh, of the Islam uh, in Muslim Jew hatred. So, uh, I was um, influenced to write my first book by the, uh, <laughs> sorry, by, by, the, by the cataclysmic acts of jihad terrorism, and that's what happened on 9-11. It was, these were acts of jihad. 
Uh, and um, I grew up in New York, uh, as did my wife. Um, one of our uh, renal fellows, uh, I'm in a division of kidney diseases uh, at, uh, at Brown University. One of our renal fellows' uh, uh, wife, w uh, his wife, was in the second tower. Um, she, did, she did manage to get out, but uh, between accounting for her in particular and, and, and lots of friends and colleagues in New York, you know, obviously it was a very harrowing day. It was a very harrowing day for the nation. And uh, on the, you know, my wife and I were both quite wired, and on the way home, I happened to pick up a book um, on Islam by Karen Armstrong, who, as I later learned, is a rather notorious apologist for Islam. And so the television is blaring in the background, as, and my wife and I, again, are still quite wired. We can't go to sleep. We're watching all the news accounts. And um, I started reading her some passages from Ms. Armstrong's book, uh, which I found rather revoltingly apologetic and treacly, and um, that was my reaction. My wife's reaction was more blunt. She just laughed. And I said, you know, honey, I, I don't really find this very funny. I, I, I mean, this is the same sort of prattle that I'm hearing on the television screen, and it just doesn't make uh, any sense to me. And uh, it, it, frankly, it angered me. And um, one thing led to another. Uh, I wound up uh, reading all the work of a great independent scholar, uh, Batya Orr, and the work of, uh, of her husband, uh, historian David Littman. Uh, they, in turn, introduced me to a man who's become a very dear friend, uh, who Nani knows well, uh, Ibn Warwick. And uh, Ibn Warwick wound up living with us for about three weeks when he was going through his visa process. He's, he's, uh, he's well on his way to becoming a, a complete uh, US citizen. Um, and he encouraged me. I started to write a few essays. He encouraged me to, to write a book. And I said, well, the only way I'll write a book is if you'll write a forward. So that was sort of my challenge to him. And he did graciously agree. And he wound up writing a, a beautiful forward uh, to my first book, uh, The Legacy of Jihad. And just very briefly, uh, what I discovered in researching uh, The Legacy of Jihad was that this is, this is a timeless institution. Uh, it's, an it's an eternal way in which Islam relates to the rest of the world. Uh, it, it is obviously warfare on one level, um, but it, it, it is also propaganda, it is also persuasion, uh, it is also uh, 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 waged through via culture, uh, and its goal is very simple. Its goal is to subjugate the entire globe to one uniform system of law, Islamic law, uh, the Sharia. Um, and uh, in the course of the initial waves of conquests, uh, you know, in medical school and maybe other professional schools, when there's a mass of material to memorize, you come up with mnemonic devices. So my mnemonic for jihad war, particularly the war-like uh, aspect of it, was MPED, massacre, pillage, enslavement, and deportation. So uh, again, th despite the apologetics that one heard around the time of 9-11 about hijacking, about religion of peace, et cetera, et cetera, when you looked at how uh, Islam spread so rapidly within 100 years of Muhammad's passing, it was through warfare. Um, and it was, it was through bloody, violent conquest. And there, were, and there were many waves which followed this initial period. So you had an Arab wave, you had uh, a, a Turco-Mongol waves, uh, you had smaller jihads waged in other parts of the world, uh, across Europe, Asia, and Africa. And the primary method was warfare. Um, so uh, I, I, I was also very interested, and I, I got into some discussion of this, about what was the system that was imposed upon the vanquished populations, those that, those that weren't um, uh, eliminated entirely. So for example, uh, essentially Zoroastrianism was eliminated from Iran, a, a tiny vestige remained. Um, Buddhism was extirpated from major parts of, of, of India. Uh, most of Eastern Christianity uh, was, was decimated. There, there, is, there is still a remnant, obviously, which exists even to this day, particularly, particularly Coptic uh, 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 Christian populations uh, in Egypt. But, but uh, uh, dramatically reduced in, in influence and, and, in, and, in, and in number. Um, 
So the system that, the, that, that was imposed upon these vanquished populations that survived uh, was, was uh, I thought, uh, elegantly termed dimitude. So the, the dimmy condition coming from Quran 929, uh, the, the ninth surah of the Quran is a, a series of timeless war proclamations. And in verse 29, it talks about waging war specifically against people of the book, uh, uh, meaning Jews and Christians primarily, but also the Zoroastrians were considered to have a text, uh, and they too were granted this uh, status of uh, submission, humiliation, if they accepted the rule of Islamic law. Um, uh, pagans, uh, uh, Buddhists, Hindus, etc., were not supposed to even get this status. They had a simple option. Uh, conversion or death. Now, as a, as a contingency, because of, particularly with Hindu uh, civilization, uh, the, the numbers were so vast, and you can see this in the correspondence when, in the early 8th century, um, Muhammad bin Qasim is, is engaged in the first Arab invasions of, of, of India. Uh, he writes back to the, the um, governor of, of Iraq at the time who had dispatched him that, look, I can't kill all these people. Uh, you, you know, this is not this is not a viable option, and so there there was uh, dimmi status was sort of grudgingly granted to the Hindus, despite the fact that they weren't scripturary peoples, and um, uh, this this was a hotly debated issue amongst Muslim theologians for a thousand years after the initial waves of conquest of India. Should should the Hindus? This would always come up. The more pious theologians would argue that. You know, these cow worshippers need to be slaughtered. They, you can't grant them demi status. But, but as a contingency, demi status was in fact granted uh, to, to the Hindus. And uh, I was thinking in terms of my second book of doing, uh, Batyur had done a, a magnificent treatment, particularly of, of how the, 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 the system of dimitude was imposed upon Jews and Christians uh, in two books, in the dimi and then um, in a particularly magisterial work uh, which focused on, on the Christian populations uh, of, of the Near East, the, dec the decline of Eastern Christianity under Islam. And what I wanted to do was address uh, uh, more broadly, particularly Hindu civilization, Buddhist civilization, animist societies, and do a work on uh, the system of dimitude as it applied to them in particular. And I was reading about uh, Hindu civilization. And I was well into planning out this book. And I came across the writings of uh, Sir Hindi, who died in 1624. And he was, he was a Sufi uh, theologian. And uh, he was very upset by the rather progressive reforms of Akbar. Now, Akbar was a, was a Mughal uh, uh, ruler. Uh, in the 16th century. Um, he started out as a very pious and rather bloody jihadist, uh, waging additional campaigns against the unvanquished Hindus of the Indian subcontinent. And he had an, a change of heart and became almost, what I would say, a, a Muslim Hindu syncretist. And he engaged in far broad-ranging reforms where he abolished uh, some of the more stringent uh, laws of, of the Sharia with regard to, to, to the non-Muslims and the Hindus specifically, uh, including this, this um, uh, jizya payment, which is part of uh, Quran 929. It's a very humiliating poll tax. In fact, um, again, because uh, perhaps because um, Hindus were not supposed to have been granted this status in the first place, there were various humiliating rituals associated with the collection of, of the poll tax. Um, sort of mock beheadings, uh, hitting on the neck, hitting in the face, hitting on the protuberance of the mandible, the jaw. Um, and with the Hindus, there was a, sorry, I have to share this with you, there was a particularly humiliating ritual, which was, which was um, you can see it discussed by the Muslim theologians rather proudly and triumphantly and, and, and very poignantly and, 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 and in a depressed state by, uh, by Hindu uh, um, uh, chroniclers. Uh, sort of complementing the Muslim narrative from the perspective of, of those victimized, um, where the Muslim tax collector could demand that the Hindu open, open his mouth and they would spit into the mouth of the Hindu as a form of humiliation. Um, but to his credit, Akbar 
was very was 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 interested in in uh, elevating the Hindus and making them more integrated into uh, uh, Mughal society, um, and his his reforms were of course anathema to the Muslim uh, ulema, including uh, uh, Sir Hindi. So I'm here. I'm planning this this follow up to the legacy of jihad. And so, for example, um, uh, here's, and, and I could understand uh, Sir Hindi's attitude towards the Hindus expressed uh, this way. Uh, he says, uh, the real purpose of levying jizya on them, the Hindus, is to humiliate them to such an extent that on account of fear of jizya, this poll tax, they may not be able to dress well and to live in grandeur. They should, be, they should constantly remain terrified and trembling. Uh, it is intended to hold them under contempt and to uphold the honor uh, and might of Islam. And he, go, and he says, cow sacrifice, which of course is, 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 is horrific to Hindus, cow sacrifice in India is the noblest of Islamic practices. The kafirs, the infidels, uh, may probably agree to pay jizya, but they shall never concede to cow sacrifice, which was done as a particularly uh, strong form of humiliation. And then, at the end of this anti-Hindu tract, which I understood, um, he says, whenever a Jew is killed, it is for the benefit of Islam. And this really jumped out at me and really became the inspiration uh, for verging away from a sort of broad uh, tapestry on, on the dimmy condition for populations other than Jews and Christians and getting back to this issue of, of Islamic anti-Semitism. In doing some further research on Sir Hindi, um, it, it, there was no evidence that he had ever been in contact with a Jew. So uh, it, it struck me that this 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 sort of um, this 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 false paradigm of Islam not having theological anti-Semitism. Uh, might not, it could, couldn't be true. This, this paradigm couldn't be true. Um, how, could, how could these sentiments emerge from, from uh, a learned theologian uh, who, who had no direct exposure? Couldn't, it couldn't have been a political statement, et cetera, et cetera. And um, it led me to re-examine the, the, the textual sources. And I want to share some of those uh, with you because we're seeing them uh, in, in evidence uh, uh, today. القرآن المكي بطبيعته لم يتعرض للحديث عن اليهود إلا ما ندر فنجد سورة بأكملها سورة مكية بأكملها تحمل اسم يعني اليهود أو بني إسرائيل هذا أمر غريب والأغرب منه أنها جاءت لتتكلم عن اليهود ليس يهود بني قينقاع وبني النضير ويهود بني قريضة وخيبر وإنما جاءت لتتكلم عن يهود هذا العصر يهود هذا القرن وليست بأي لغة إنما بلغة إعلان الفناء بلغة حفر القبر بلغة يعني يعني لاحظ أن سورة الإسراء حكمت بالفناء على اليهود قبل أن يكون يهودي واحد على هذه الأرض سورة الإسراء أعلنت عن عن انهيار ما يعرف بدولة إسرائيل قبل أن تقوم هذه الدولة أن بركة فلسطين تتعلق بالقضاء على بؤرة الفساد العالمية فيها رأس الأفعى عندما تقطع رأس الأفعى هنا في فلسطين رأس أفعى الفساد وتتقطع أوصال أخطبوطها في العالم كله هنا ستحل البركة الحقيقية على بالقضاء على يهود هنا في فلسطين هذا من أروع ألوان البركة الحقيقية لفلسطين والذي ستتبعه دائرة بركة أكبر والحمد لله رب العالمين عندما يكون هذا تأسيسا لخلافة راشدة تعم الأرض This is the deputy speaker of the Hamas parliament. Now. الكريمة إن الله لا يصلفن أمة محمد على بني يهود إلى يوم القيامة حتى يندحروا وحتى يمسخهم الله سبحانه وتعالى كما مسخهم حينما عصى الله سبحانه وتعالى ولذلك 
الله سبحانه وتعالى سلط أمة محمد والشعب الفلسطيني المجاهد على هؤلاء من إخوان القردة والخنازير حتى نفلسهم بإذن الله سبحانه وتعالى من أرضنا ومن مقدساتنا This is very recent, and this has generated a lot of controversy. Now, now the PA Mufti, of course, this is, this is not, that was, uh, I've shown you a couple of things that were from Hamas. This is from the PA Mufti, the current PA Mufti, and now he's denying the context for this. And of course, there is only one context, but. Uh, and, and, and fortunately, Netanyahu, finally an Israeli prime minister, is reacting to this kind of sacralized hatred, but here we go.
إلا شجر الغرقد لذلك ليس عجيبا أن تروا الغرقد يحيط بالمستوطنات ويحيط بالمستعمرات That's it. Uh, I, I think I think you've seen enough. What I, what I wanted what I wanted to to emphasize here is first of all, if we go back to the first clip. Um, one of the verses that the speaker invokes. Uh, well, a couple of other things to realize is that you're often seeing people who are, particularly in the case of Hamas, they are they are not only clerics; they're members of parliament. And that pinpoints a problem right off the bat, which is, which is the, the, the failure of Islam to separate religion and politics to this day. So it's, it's, it's not at all uncommon to have uh, these kinds of dual roles, politicians, clerics, at, at the same time. Um, but uh, the first speaker, <coughs> who was a Hamas cleric, uh, talked about uh, actually a verse from the opening surah, the opening chapter of the Quran. Um, and uh, I interestingly, um, the, the Quran, part of the reason that, that uh, uh, novices have so much trouble uh, with, with the Quran is that its organizing principle has nothing to do with, with chronology. So for example, the opening surah, the Fatiha, uh, is, a, is a very short surah, but, but surahs two Chapters 2 to 114 are, are arranged purely on the basis of longest to shortest. And so you get this rambling, discursive narrative, which is, which is very, very difficult uh, to follow. And of course, to understand it, you need to refer to the Quranic commentaries, to the Hadith, to the Sirah, the Hadith, are the words, deeds, and even physical gestures of Muhammad. Uh, a crude analogy might be the Gospels, as recorded by his pious early, earliest Muslim companions. The Sirah are the earliest sacralized Muslim biographies of Muhammad. Um, so without, without the Quranic commentaries, without the Hadith, without the Sirah, it's very, very difficult often to interpret uh, m m many, many parts uh, of the Quran. But the seventh verse of this opening Surah which is repeated by pious Muslims up to about 17 times a day during their five different prayer sessions, is an eternal curse upon the Jews and Christians. So the Jews are those who have incurred Allah's ang anger or wrath, and the Christians are those who have gone astray. And this is something that has been emphasized uh, across a span of 13 centuries in the major Quranic commentaries. So uh, in the, um, I have the uh, this wonderful well, <laughs> version of the Quran uh, that was, uh, that, that was uh, published uh, under Saudi sponsorship. Um, but it's, what, what's, what's, uh, what's Im unique about it is that it really includes a lot of uh, uh, references, in some cases to commentaries, but also to the Hadith. And, you know, so of course, in, in, in helping to explain this verse, they, they cite a canonical hadith where Muhammad himself says that, well, those who've incurred Allah's anger are the Jews, and those, those who've gone astray are the Christians. And again, for 13 centuries from mainstream exegesis, from mainstream uh, Quranic commentaries, that, that is, uh, is the reference. The other thing that these early clips uh, show you is that uh, the situation in historical Palestine is linked to global jihad, uh, to conquests that extend way beyond this, this regional or localized conflicts, to Europe, to, to, to North and South America, in the case of the, of the, uh, the second Hamas uh, cleric. Um, and then uh, frequent references, even unfortunately to, by this three-year-old child, to the Jews as apes or apes and pigs. These are all Quranic references. So uh, Quran 560 refers to the Jews as apes and pigs. Uh, Quran 265 and 7166 uh, to the Jews uh, as, as apes. And uh, Muhammad himself, before he orchestrates the slaughter of the Jewish tribe Banu Qurayza, in, and this you have to go to the Sirah, to, to, an import, to the important, uh, especially the two most important biographies of Muhammad by Ibn Ishaq uh, and Ibn Sa'd. And, and, and that's, 
That's how he refers to the Jews that he subsequently slaughters uh, before engaging in that slaughter as, the, as, uh, as, as, a, as apes. Um, and, and so uh, these motifs, uh, 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 particularly the, the Jews as apes or apes and pigs, have been used historically to incite uh, slaughter of, of the Jews across uh, space and time. So pogroms in, in, in Spain, uh, supposedly tolerant Muslim Spain, uh, North Africa, uh, uh, I Iraq, uh, Iran, these, these uh, motifs have been invoked uh, it, to, to incite or to celebrate the slaughter uh, of Jewish populations uh, during, uh, during pogroms. Um, and then, of course, you know, this, this thing that's made the news recently uh, is an invocation when now we're moving to Islamic eschatology or end of times uh, theology. And the Jews play a very central role, unfortunately, in, in, in the end of times, in ushering in uh, the end of times, um, in both Shiite and Sunni uh, theology. Um, the Jews uh, must be slaughtered to usher in uh, the end of times. And uh, obviously, this, 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 dates, uh, this dates from the, from the uh, canonical texts themselves, uh, but you'll also see it referred to in explanations of, of Quranic verses. It was alluded to. Uh, it's not something from the modern uh, period. Um, in the modern era, however, uh, the, the, the ex-Mufti of Jerusalem uh, frequently included this in his uh, propagandistic uh, tracks, uh, w whether he was trying to organize Bosnian Muslims or in the Middle East itself. Um, and of course, in the Hamas charter, uh, this canonical hadith um, is, plays a, a prominent role, al along with other of the motifs that you've seen. So, so literally the first... Um, uh, in the preamble to the Hamas Charter uh, is Quran 3112. Uh, what is all this anger about? Uh, the, the, the Jews uh, have engendered Allah's anger because they've killed the biblical prophets and transgressed against the will of Allah. This is literally how the Hamas covenant opens up in its, in its preamble. Um, and the, the Hamas covenant is actually very useful in terms of uh, seeing how these classical motifs are put together into a founding political statement uh, that calls for the, ultimately, for the annihilation of the Jews by jihad. So the, so the whole covenant is really, it, 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 um, it sort of um, goes back and forth between this, this sort of virulent uh, anti-Semitism and jihad as, as, the, as the solution or ultimate solution. And even when European motifs that we would recognize, like the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, are referred to in the Covenant. They are referred to as uh, essentially validating uh, purely Islamic motifs. So when the, when the Protocols are invoked, you'll also see ver uh, reference to verse like Quran 564, which, which calls the Jews spreaders of corruption. So we really, we really have to move away from, I think, this existing paradigm that somehow, you know, the, 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 the Arab Muslim, the larger Muslim world was infected uh, by, by European uh, motifs. Um, they, they just see validation uh, in, in, these, in, these, uh, in, in, in things like the protocols, in Christian anti-Semitic motifs, um, and obviously in, in, uh, in, in, the, in all the the vast, hideous armamentarium of anti-Semitism that the, that, the that the Nazis must muster. And this is critically important because if there are efforts to denazify the Middle East, to, to ban the selling of, of the protocols, uh, to, to ban Mein Kampf, et cetera, et cetera, which is a you know, very popular uh, seller in, in the Middle East, you would still be left with the core residual, uh, which, which um, uh, the Jewish intelligentsia does not appear interested in, in dealing with. And this is, a, this is a critical, critical flaw, and I think uh, these, these videos uh, uh, should, should uh, drive that point home. The other thing is that um, obviously we're living in, a, you know, in, 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 a, in an era where no one would deny that, that uh, anti-Semitism is particularly rampant. And one of the reasons for this, I think, again, uh, has to do with, with the notion of uh, the Jews having breached the Dhimma. So this is not, this is not a purely uh, Judeocentric motif. 
Uh, the same thing would, would happen, to, and, and is happening, to any, any dimmy population that somehow liberated itself from the Sharia. So this, this amplifies, in the case of the Jews, it amplifies this, this virulent uh, mainstream anti-Semitic uh, uh, theology. Um, but it's another powerful source. Um, to, to, so, so Israel is considered to have been a land uh, conquered by jihad and a permanent part of the Dar al-Islam. So on a, on a political level, uh, it, is, it is anathema that it should uh, be, be uh, liberated from, from the Sharia and that even as, as, the, as the Muslims say, th themselves will, will, will remind uh, us, uh, a piece of, of this uh, territory should no longer be under the Sharia. Now, when I was, um, when I was doing some, uh, some background research actually on the Mufti, this was just purely by coincidence, um, I came across uh, a very, very interesting um, uh, a document. Um, and there, there was a couple of points I wanted to make before I get to that. Uh, but uh, the, the, um, recently, there was some polling data uh, coming out of uh, actually the, the, the rather leftist uh, Israel Foundation. This is uh, uh, Clinton's pollster, uh, Greenberg. And he found that um, uh, a face-to-face -face survey in Arabic of 1,010 Palestinian adults in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip revealed that almost 75% of them uh, b agreed with the dictates of this annihilationist hadith uh, that, that, that the PA Mufti just recited uh, a week and a half ago. Um, so these, are, these motifs are very, very much uh, alive. Um, and that, uh, th the, in essence, that motif is really uh, the follow-up to this idea in the Quran that the Jews are, are prophet killers. So it's, it, it, it really, it, it follows this, this perfect archetypal logic which would now extend into the Hadith where the Jews themselves are, as the little girl said, are accused of poisoning uh, Muhammad. And in fact, uh, when, we, when we look further at the traditions, uh, Muhammad is, is, is believed to have died from the, what amounts to this Jewish conspiracy, ultimately. Even though he survived the initial poisoning attempt, the Jews are ultimately, quote, credited or discredited uh, as a result of having caused his poisoning. So, so it, 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 again, the, the logic is completed now. They, they're responsible, the Jews are responsible for killing uh, Muhammad as well. And another interesting thing that you will see, I didn't, I didn't include it, there's just so many of these depressing motifs, um, is that the basic split uh, in, is, in Islam between Sunni and Shiite, uh, this is not found in the, in the Hadith even. It's, it's, in, it's in some early Sunni historiographies by the great uh, polymath and historian Tabari who died in 923. You will see reference to this sectarian split as being a Jewish conspiracy. Uh, dating back to a period of Islam's so-called political innocence, that it was, it was uh, uh, Abdullah ibn Saba, who was supposed to, uh, who was a Yemenite Jew, who converted to Islam and in fact foments the Shiite uh, 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 revolution against the Sunnis, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's a Jew that's responsible for this primal breach of Islam's political innocence. So, these are all conspiratorial themes that have absolutely nothing to do with anything that came out of the West and Europe. I mean, the, these are indigenous, intrinsic themes. And now you can see how when independent themes have, that have come out of the West would validate these themes. But it is putting the cart before the horse to claim that somehow this, this, this innocent, tolerant civilization was infected by uh, conspiratorial Jew hatred uh, uh, from the West. But um, uh, I digress. But getting back to what I wanted to say about uh, this fascinating, uh, what turned out to be a fatwa that I found in the Mufti's file, it was declassified, the CIA file was declassified less than 10 years ago. And I finally made a trip, I urge everyone to go at some point, uh, it's a fascinating place, to the U.S. National Archives. And so, you know, you have to go through this whole rigmarole of bureaucratic procedures to get your hands on materials and they watch you like a hawk and you can photocopy certain things. And I'm going through the Mufti's file and, you know, some of it's illegible and some of it's just boring. And, and then I stumbled across this fatwa that was um, written 
Uh, January 5th, 1956, by the Grand Mufti uh, of Egypt, uh, at the time, Sheikh Hassan Mamoun, and it was signed by all the leading clerics of the different Sunni Islamic schools of jurisprudence. There are four major schools, the Hanbali, the Hanafi, the Shafi'ite, the Maliki. So all of the, all of the heads of these different uh, 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 areas of jurisprudence signed on to this fatwa, and it was published in Arabic in Al-Aram, and some, some uh, thoughtful person in the U.S. Embassy, uh, affluent in Arabic, appreciated its significance and translated it into English, and God only knows why it wound up in the Mufti's file, but, but at least it was the period that the Mufti himself resided in Egypt. So someone shoved it into his file, and there it was. And um, this, is, this is early in 1956. It's nine months or so before the 56 war breaks out, the Sinai War. So it has nothing to do with, with, the, with the heat of the moment of that conflagration. And it is really a very <coughs> revealing mainstream uh, example of these conjoined motivations of jihad and conspiratorial Jew hatred. So let me, let me read you some extracts from it. Muslims cannot conclude peace with those Jews who have usurped the territory of Palestine and attacked its people and their property in any manner which allows the Jews to continue as a state in that sacred Muslim territory. As Jews have taken a part, and here it's admitted, a part of Palestine, and there established their non-Islamic government, and have also evacuated from that part most of its Muslim inhabitants, jihad, to restore the country to its people, is the duty of all Muslims, not just those who can undertake it. And since all Islamic countries constitute the abode of every Muslim, the jihad is imperative for both the Muslims inhabiting the territory attacked and Muslims everywhere else, because even though some sections have not been attacked directly, the attack nevertheless took place on a part of the Muslim territory, which is a legitimate residence for any Muslim. Everyone knows, now here's the conspiratorial Jew hatred, everyone knows that from the early days of Islam to the present day, the Jews have been plotting against Islam and Muslims and the Islamic homeland. They do not propose to be content with the attack they made on Palestine and Al-Aqsa Mosque, but they plan for the possession of all Islamic territories from the Nile to the Euphrates. So you can't get more authoritative than this. Al-Azhar University is the Vatican of Sunni Islam. This is not Hamas. Now, Hamas repeats these kinds of, of, of motifs uh, in, its, in, its, in its covenant. But, but, to, but to isolate and say that Hamas is somehow quote-unquote radical Islam and it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a separate, distinct entity that we can compartmentalize and, uh, as, as being opposed to the mainstream is absolutely ridiculous. Um, more importantly, I think, you know, for, for our era, is to see that... Um, uh, uh, I'll try and put two things together here, because um, I'm staring at one on the floor. Uh, in in, in the, the legacy of Islamic anti-Semitism, uh, I took considerable effort to translate uh, significant extracts uh, from what turned out to be the magnum opus of the late uh, Sheikh Muhammad Tantawi. Now, Tantawi worked his way up through the clerical hierarchy, uh, and uh, he, this, his PhD thesis uh, is a, is a 700-page uh, work called Jews in the Quran and the Traditions. And this was put together in the late 1960s, and it wound up to be his ticket to stardom in the, in the, in the uh, Muslim world. Um, he eventually became the Grand Imam of Al-Azhar University, where he served for 14 years until his death in uh, March of, of, of 2010. And so I, was, I, was, I, I felt that it was a critically important work to understand. Now, now mind you, um, the, 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 um, this would be, uh, when you see the material, I'll give you, I'll give you the crux of, of his ideas, um, but it's virulently anti-Semitic. But, but basically, uh, this would be equivalent to uh, then Cardinal Ratzinger uh, making his life work uh, an enormous compendium of, of all the anti-Semitic motifs from Christianity, celebrating them, extolling them for all times, and then the Vatican in our era saying, 
this is a man worthy of being the Pope. That's, that's what this amounts to. And so here's the gist of what he says in this, his magnum opus. The Koran describes the Jews with their own particular degenerate characteristics, i.e. killing the prophets of Allah. Again, Koran 261.3.1.12. <laughs> Corrupting his words by putting them in the wrong places. Consuming the people's wealth frivolously. Refusal to distance themselves from the evil they do. These are all Quranic references. And other ugly characteristics caused by their deep-rooted lasciviousness. Only a minority of the Jews keep their word. All Jews are not the same. The good ones become Muslims. This is Quran 3113. <laughs> the bad ones do not. You know, th this is, and, and he went on, uh, he wound up having a quote unquote dialogue where he says that the idea of this dialogue is to stick, uh, put a stick into the eye of your opponent with, with, the, um, with, the, with the then uh, chief rabbi of, 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 uh, of Israel, Israel Mayor Lau. And, and, and he, around that time, he, he, he said, referring back to this PhD thesis that I just read you an extract from, that, oh, he still believed every word uh, in that thesis. Uh, he, he went on to, uh, again, describe the Jews as the enemies of, of Allah, descendants of apes and pigs in April 2002. And he legitimized, legitimized homicide bombing of Jews um, right after the Netanya massacre. So, so he didn't disavow it even after the Netanya uh, massacre. And this is the Sunni equivalent of the Muslim Pope. So you can't get more uh, mainstream uh, than this. And it's not surprising then that these kinds of uh, attitudes would lead uh, when, in, in different historical periods to massive uh, uh, pogroms. And I want to describe that to you, but I think equally poignant is what happens in terms of between these paroxysms of, of, of mass violence, the sort of chronic grinding oppression uh, that this kind of sacralized hatred leads to. And if you'll bear with me, uh, please, I, um, I included some material in the Legacy of Islamic Antisemitism from historical Palestine itself. Because I think this is critically important. First of all, it's a, it's a very poorly uh, 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 recognized history. Uh, you have to go to a whole series of varied sources to put it together into one place, as I attempted to do. But this is the plight of the vanquished Jews in their indigenous homeland under Islam. And this is their chronic situation. Uh, and I think it's, it really bears uh, 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 reflection. Um, so I'll just read to you some, uh, a few passages, uh, some, some of my own summaries, and then some eyewitness accounts. Um, Perhaps the clearest outward manifestation of the inferiority and humiliation of the dhimmis were the prohibitions, again, so this is now not just applying to Jews, it's Jews and Christians, uh, the prohibitions regarding their dress codes and demands that distinguishing signs be placed on the entrances of dhimmi houses. During the Abbasid Caliphates, again, another one of these sort of wandering golden ages, during the Abbasid Caliphates of Harun al-Rashid from 786 to 809 and al Mutawakil 847 to 861, Jews and Christians were required to wear yellow. This is uh, a millennium before the Nazis. This is before anything the Vatican imposed um, as patches attached to their garments or hats. Later, to differentiate further between Christians and Jews, the Christians were required to wear blue. In 850, consistent with Quranic verses associating them with Satan and hell, and there are numerous verses, um, al Mutawakil decreed that Jews and Christians attach wooden images of devils to the doors of their homes to distinguish them from the homes of Muslims. And of course, um, as Batyur points out, these kinds of, of actions led to, quote, a wave of religious persecution, forced conversions, and the elimination of churches and synagogues. Um, so moving forward uh, about uh, two centuries, uh, uh, Solomon ben Jerohim, the wise, who was a major uh, Karaite uh, exegete, uh, who lived in mid-10th century uh, Jerusalem, uh, observed the following. What can you say about a people, the Muslims, who curse you when you greet them, and when you do not greet them, humiliate you and offend you? When you talk to them, they want you to differ with them so that you be, you, you be considered a sinner. 
I have learned that the Jews of Samarkand, now he's talking about outside of Palestine, in the region where they say God is one, people who hear it testify, testify that by saying so, they have become Muslims. Therefore, if they want to remain Jews, they can only resort to saying there are a thousand gods or ten or less or more. Then the Muslims say, you are indeed infidels, and will let them hold their religion. The calamities inflicted upon the Jews under Islam are countless. Moving ahead to uh, Isaac bin Samuel of Acre, who lived from 1270 to 1350, and he was one of the outstanding uh, Kabbalists of, of his time. Uh, and interestingly, he concluded, despite the persecutions under Christendom, that it was preferable for him to live under Christendom uh, in this period. And so he actually fled uh, after being imprisoned when Acre was, was taken from the Crusaders by the, by the Mamluks. Um, and here's what he says. They, the Muslims, strike upon the head of the children of Israel who dwell in their lands, and they thus extort money from them by force. For they say in their tongue, Mal al Yahudi Muba, it is lawful to take money of the Jews. For in the eyes of the Muslims, the children of Israel are as open to abuse as an unprotected field. In their law and statutes, they rule that the testimony of a Muslim, now this is not just for Jews, this is for Dimmies in general, uh, is always to be believed against that of a Jew. For this reason, our rabbis of blessed memory have said, rather beneath the yoke of Edom, of Christendom, than that of Ishmael. So now we're, that's, that, that we're into the late, the end of the, the, the 13th century. Um, then I wanted to read to you, uh, moving ahead to 1700. This is, this is from a fascinating chronicle by uh, Gedalia of Shibiatsi, a, a Polish Jew who traveled to Jerusalem and wrote something called Pray for the Peace of Jerusalem. Uh, and he, he wrote this to try and garner uh, money for, for, the, for the Jews who were suffering at this time. And please bear with me, it's an extended uh, but very poignant extract. And this is now, we're now almost a thousand years after the first extract that I read to you uh, across the continuum, across different Muslim empires, different Muslim rulers. But, but listen to what he says. We, Jews, were obliged to give a large sum of money to the Muslim authorities in Jerusalem in order to be allowed to build a new synagogue. Although the old synagogue was small and we only wanted to enlarge it very slightly, it was forbidden under Islamic law to modify the least part. In addition to the expenses and bribes destined to win the favor of the Muslims, each male was obliged to pay an annual poll tax of two pieces of gold to the Sultan. The rich man was not obliged to give more, but the poor man could not give less. Every year, generally during the festival of the Passover, and, uh, and generally during the festival, uh, an official from Constantinople would arrive in Jerusalem. He who did not have the means to pay the tax was thrown into prison, and the Jewish community was obliged to redeem him, so collective punishment. The official remained in Jerusalem for about two months, and consequently, during that period, the poor people would hide wherever they could. This is copiously documented in the Geniza documentary record uh, by Goytain over, over centuries. But if ever they were caught, they would be redeemed by community funds. The official sent his soldiers throughout the streets to control the papers of the passers-by. For a certificate was provided to those who had already paid the tax. If anyone was found without his certificate, he had to present himself before the official with the required sum. Otherwise, he was imprisoned until such time as he could be redeemed. The Christians were also obliged to pay the poll tax. During the week, the, the, the paupers dared not show themselves outside. In their wickedness, the Muslim soldiers would go to the synagogues, waiting by the doors, requesting the certificate of payment from the congregants who emerged. No Jew or Christian is allowed to ride a horse, but a donkey is permitted, for in the eyes of Muslims, Christians and Jews are inferior beings. The Muslims do not allow any member of another faith, unless he converts to their religion, entry to the Temple Mount area. For well, they claim that no other religion is sufficiently pure to enter this holy spot, 1700. They never weary of claiming that although God had originally chosen the people of Israel, he had since abandoned them on account of their iniquities in order to choose the Muslims. So clear supersessionism. In the land of Israel, no member of any other religion besides Islam may wear the color green, even if it is a thread of cotton like that which we decorate our prayer shawls. If a Muslim perceives it, that could bring trouble. Similarly, it is not permitted to wear green, a green or white turban. On the Sabbath, however, we wear white turbans on the crown of which we place a piece of cloth of another, of another color as a distinguishing mark. 
The Christians are not allowed to wear a turban, but they wear a hat instead, as is customary in Poland. Moreover, the Muslim world requires that each religious denomination wear its specific garment so that each people may be distinguished from another. This distinction also applies to footwear. Indeed, the Jews wear shoes of a dark blue color, whereas Christians wear red shoes. No one can use green, for this color is worn solely by Muslims. The latter are very hostile towards Jews and inflict upon them vexations in the streets of the city. The common folk persecute the Jews, for we are forbidden to defend ourselves against the Turks or the Arabs. This is the period of Ottoman rule. Um, if an Arab strikes a Jew, he, the Jew, must appease him, but dare not rebuke him for fear that he may be struck even harder, which they, the Arabs, do without the slightest scruple. This is the way the Oriental Jews, remember, this is a Polish Jew writing this, uh, react, for they are accustomed to this treatment. Where, whereas the European Jews, who are not yet accustomed to suffer being assaulted by the Arabs, insult them in return. Even the Christians are subjected to these vexations. If a Jew offends a Muslim, the latter strikes him a brutal blow with his shoe in order to demean him, without anyone's being able to prevent him from doing it. The Christians fall victim to the same treatment, and they suffer as much as the Jews, except that the former are very rich by reason of the subsidies that they receive from abroad. And they use this money to bribe the Arabs. As for the Jews, they do not possess much money with which to oil the palms of the Muslims, and consequently, they are subject to much greater suffering. Now, to be fair, the Ottoman Empire, under tremendous pressure uh, and, and defeat uh, by the European powers, was forced to engage in what the Ottomans considered to be quote unquote capitulations. But essentially, these were what turned out to be half-hearted and regardless unsuccessful attempts to reform some of these brutally discriminating aspects of the Sharia, the so-called Tanzimat reforms. Um, the first round was iterated around 1839, and there were later rounds, n none of which were, were successful. Um, I'm going to read you another extract. This is from 1847, again in Palestine, by the Jewish travelogue writer J.J. Uh, Binyamin II. Deep misery, again, this is after the Tanzimat reforms were, were at least attempted. Deep misery and continual oppression are the right words to describe the condition of the children of Israel in the land of their fathers. They are entirely destitute of every legal protection and every means of safety. Instead of security afforded by law, which is unknown in these countries, they are completely under the orders of the sheikhs and pashas, men whose character and feelings inspire but little confidence from the beginning. It is only the European consuls who frequently take care of the oppressed and afford them some protection. With unheard of rapacity, tax upon tax is leveled on them, and with the exception of Jerusalem, the taxes demanded are arbitrary. Whole communities have been, in, been impoverished by the exorbitant claims of the sheikhs, who, under the most trifling pretenses and without being subject to any control, oppress the Jews with fresh burdens. In the strict sense of the word, the Jews are not even masters of their own property. They do not even venture to complain when they are robbed and plundered. Their lives are taken into as little consideration as their property, their lives. They are exposed to the caprice of anyone, even the smallest pretext, even a harmless discussion, a word dropped in conversation, is enough to cause bloody reprisals. Violence of every kind is, a is of daily occurrence. When, for instance, in the contests of Muhammad Ali, so this was uh, in turn seen struggle within, within the Muslim empire, uh, with the sublime port, with the Ottomans, the city of Hebron was besieged by Egyptian troops and taken by storm. The Jews were murdered and plundered, and the survivors scarcely even allowed to remain, uh, retain, uh, retain a few rags to cover themselves. No pen can describe the despair of these unfortunates, and I have some uh, eyewitness accounts of this in the compendium. The women were treated with brutal cruelty, and even to this day, many are found who since that time uh, are miserable cripples. With truth can the lamentations of Jeremiah be employed here. Since that great misfortune, up to the present day, the Jews of Hebron languish in the deepest misery, and the present sheikh is unwearied in the endeavors, not to allow their condition to be ameliorated, but on the contrary, he makes it worse. The chief evidence of their miserable condition, miserable condition is the universal poverty which we remarked in Palestine, and which is here truly astonishing, 
for nowhere else in our long journeys in Europe, Asia, and Africa, he traveled extensively, uh, did we observe it among the Jews. It even causes leprosy among the Jews of Palestine as in former times. Robbed of their means of subsistence from the cultivation of the soil and the pursuit of trade, they exist upon the charity of their brethren in the faith in foreign parts. In a word, the state of the Jews in Palestine, physically and mentally, is an unbearable one. Now, given this kind of chronic persecution, it's not surprising then, I would think, uh, to see what happens in terms of, of full-fledged uh, pogroms. And so, what I'm going to just quickly summarize for you is, is a series across space and time uh, of, of, of mass murders, uh, uh, pogroms, violence committed against Jews in Islamdom. Uh, without getting into all the details about them, maybe we can talk about this a little bit in the discussion, they, they were, they were uh, uh, the result of specific incitement, anti-Semitic motives. Um, 6,000 Jews massacred in Fez in 1033. Hundreds of Jews slaughtered in Muslim Cordoba between 1010 and 1015. 4,000 Jews killed in Muslim riots in Grenada in 1066, wiping out the entire community. By the way, in this particular pogrom, uh, more Jews were killed in this one pogrom uh, than were killed in the ravages 30 years later uh, when the Crusaders set out uh, for, for Palestine and ravaged the Jewish communities of the Rhineland. This, this was a more, much more extensive massacre. The Berber Almohad depredations of Jews and Christians uh, in Spain and North Africa between 1130 and 1230 till 1232 which killed tens of thousands while forcibly converting thousands more and subjecting the forced Jewish converts uh, to Islam to a Muslim inquisition. This is what Maimonides uh, wrote about. Uh, the 1291 pogroms in Baghdad and its environs, which killed at least hundreds of Jews. The 1465 pogrom against the Jews of Fez. The late 15th century pogrom against the Jews of the southern Moroccan oasis of Tuat. The 1679 pogroms against and then expulsion of 10,000 Jews from Sana, Yemen, to the unlivable, hot, and dry plain of Tihama, from which only 1,000 returned alive in 1680, 90% having died from exposure. Recurring Muslim anti-Jewish violence, including pogroms and forced conversions, throughout the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries, which rendered areas of Iran, for example, Tabriz, Judenrein, and that was the first time I had seen this word in a context outside of Europe. The 1834 pogrom in Safat, this was during the Muhammad Ali era, uh, where raging Muslim mobs killed and grievously wounded hundreds of Jews. The 1888 massacres of Jews in Isfahan and Shiraz, Iran. The 1910 pogrom in Shiraz. The pillage and destruction of the Casablanca, Morocco ghetto in 1907. The pillage of the ghetto of Fez, Morocco in 1912. The government sanctioned, this is the Turkish government sanctioned, anti-Jewish pogroms by Muslims in Turkish Eastern Thrace during June, July, 1934, this is under Ataturk, which ethnically cleansed at least 3,000 Jews. And the series of pogroms, expropriations, and finally mass expulsions of some 900,000 Jews from Arab Muslim nations, beginning in 1941 in Baghdad, the murderous Farhu, during which 600 Jews were murdered and at least 12,000 pillaged, eventually involving cities and towns in Egypt, Morocco, Libya, Syria, Aden, Bahrain, and culminating in 1967 in Tunisia that accompanied the planning and creation of a Jewish state, Israel, on a portion of the Jews' ancestral homeland. So I'd like to conclude um, with the thought experiment that I alluded to at the beginning. Um, after I had finished um, the major sections of uh, my anti-Semitism compendium, including a very long uh, survey, which was really a book length in itself. It was a 180,000 word survey, which was introducing the documents and, and uh, uh, essays by um, uh, experts in, uh, uh, who described uh, the conditions of individual Jewish communities, um, and then more documents, et cetera, which made up the rest of the book. Um, I, uh, I had come across something that's actually fascinating, and I, and I want to share it with you. So I, by email, uh, I contacted uh, uh, 
I'll call them, for lack of a better descriptor, representatives of the Jewish intelligentsia, uh, whether, th whether they were scholars, uh, uh, activists, uh, journalists, et cetera, et cetera, in including even an ambassador. Uh, and I said, in your opinion, would this quote, and I'll read it to you, exemplify racial or at least ethnic anti-Semitism? Moreover, would you please hazard a guess as to where and when it was written based upon the contents? And I'll read you this quote. Our people, the Muslims, observing thus the occupation of the Jews and the Christians, concluded that the religion of the Jews must compare unfavorably, as do their professions, and that their unbelief must be the foulest of all, since they are the filthiest of all nations. Why the Christians, ugly as they are, are physically less repulsive than the Jews, may be explained by the fact that the Jews, by not intermarrying, have intensified the offensiveness of their features. Exotic elements have not mingled with them. Neither have males of alien races has, had intercourse with their women, nor have their men cohabited with females of a foreign stock. The Jewish race, therefore, has been denied high mental qualities, sound physique, and superior lactation. The same results obtain when horses, camels, donkeys, and pigeons are inbred. So not surprisingly, um, and I'll read you some of the responses I got from my correspondents, uh, they, re they reflected the conventional academic and journalistic wisdom, or lack thereof, which, which continues uh, to assert that Muslim Jew hatred is, again, is a recent phenomenon. It's a product of, of, uh, of, of trends that began in the late 19th or early 20th centuries. It's a byproduct of the advent of Zionism and certainly the creation of the state of Israel, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a loose amalgam of, of recycled medieval Christian Judeophobic motifs, uh, calumnies from the protocols of the, the elders of Zion, and, and then, of course, modern racist European fascist Nazi propaganda. And so sort of a prototypical uh, uh, understanding of this was actually published. It was pointed out to me by Janet Levy, and then and I went and, and read it uh, in, in The Looming Tower. The Looming Tower was Lawrence Wright's uh, book about, uh, it's, actually, it's actually a decent journalistic account of the 9-11 attacks. But in it, he makes the following statement, which really reflects the so-called conventional wisdom. He writes, until the end of World War II, Jews lived safely, although submissively, under Muslim rule for 1,200 years, enjoying full religious freedom. But in the 1930s, Nazi propaganda on Arabic language shortwave radio, coupled with slanders by Christian missionaries in the region, infected the area with this ancient Western prejudice. After the war, Cairo became a sanctuary for Nazis, who advised the military and the government. The rise of the Islamist movement coincided with the decline of fascism, but they overlapped in Egypt, and the germ passed into a new carrier. And of course, there was no footnoting, because in fact, this was the, the conventional wisdom as he saw it. So now, I'm going to read you some of the responses to that quote that I, that I read you. Uh, again, from the Jewish intelligentsia. Of course, it's anti-Semitism of the most vile, racist stripe, which leads me to think it likely dates from the 19th century at the earliest. It sounds like the sort of thing one would read in the anti-Semitic popular literature of the Edwardian period. So my guess would be somewhere between 1830 and the 1920s. I imagine this was written under the influence of modern theories of racial inferiority. If I had to hazard a guess, I would say this is from a sermon in Gaza, mosque this past Friday. Uh, could, could be any mosque in the Muslim world or Nazi Germany if it weren't for the first line, definitely racial. What about, how about current Wahhabi establishment? I have no idea who said it, but I'll hazard a guess just for sport. The Mufti of Jerusalem, circa 1940. Probably last week from one of the mullahs in the United Kingdom. Yes, racist to the point of being Nazi-like, I would say the Mufti of Jerusalem or some other Islamo-fascist or maybe contemporary Wahhabi. It's the usual modern, modern boilerplate from the Middle East. In fact, what I read to you comes from a very interesting tract that was written in the middle of the ninth century. Um, the, 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 the under al-Mutawakil, after there had been a, a, a lot of internal scene struggle uh, in, in the Abbasid Empire, this was the p transition from, from the Mutazilites back to a more traditional 
uh, Islam. The, the Mutazilites had various sort of uh, uh, experiments and, and, and her heresies. I mean, they, they were very strong jihadists and they waged their own inquisition against Muslims who wouldn't accept their um, sort of pseudo-rationalistic belief system. Um, it's a whole separate argument, and it's been be beautifully uh, uh, elaborated by the great uh, Ignaz Goldze here. Suffice to say, they, they had nothing to do with uh, sort of presaging Western enlightenment, as, as some have claimed. But regardless, Mutawakil represented a return to Islamic orthodoxy. What he noticed as, a, as an astute politician was that despite the fact that, that, that the external threat to the Islamic empire came from the Christian empires, was that the population of Muslims hated the Jews much more. And so he commissioned the greatest writer of his era in Arabic, uh, and a true polymath of that era, Al-Jahiz, to write an anti-Christian tract. But Al-Jahiz, being you know, an intellectual and wanting to understand what was going on, confirmed, in fact, his ruler's observation that, yes, the Muslim masses indeed did hate the Jews more than the Christians, and, and he couldn't understand it from what you heard him write. And, and this is sort of, it's interesting because, you know, he was interested in science, et cetera, but this was the, this was the sort of science that he, he engaged in. And, um, but when it came to explaining his, his brethren, his Muslim, Muslim co-religionists' hatred, he said there were two factors. One was a Quranic verse, which I haven't mentioned yet, Quran 582, which sort of paradoxically claims that the Jews harbor the most intense hatred for the Muslims. And of course, Muhammad's, as he put it, rancorous interactions with the Jews of Medina, where, he, you know, where Muhammad winds up um, you know, waging basically a, pro a proto-jihad against the Jews, uh, all the usual things, massacre, killing, uh, expulsion, uh, enslavement, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, be, because, of, because of various uh, uh, acts of perfidy or, or, or claimed acts of perfidy committed by the Jews who basically didn't see him as their Messiah. Um, after all, he wasn't Jewish. Uh, but but, but uh, so uh, Jahiz felt that that was the reason for the Muslims' visceral hatred. It was, it was in fact, theological. And he's writing this in the, in the ninth century. Now, he wants to try and change it because they're not a political threat. They're crushed. And interestingly enough, I, I found, better than the New York Times in, in, in our era, in, in, in the middle of the ninth century, there was another Iraqi, a Sufi, who noticed exactly the same thing, except he didn't think it was a, a direct result of Quran 582. He thought it was purely a result of Muhammad's rancorous interaction with the Jews of Medina, i.e., why did the Muslims hate the Jews more than the Christians? And, and so I, I, think, I think this little anecdote, um, in its own way, uh, highlights the predicament. Um, you know, this, this, it, this, this sort of hatred and its ugly consequences are hardwired. Um, and for whatever the reasons, uh, the, the, uh, the Jewish intelligentsia uh, does not want to come to grips with this. And um, it's not going to go away by, by being ignored. And, it's, and, and, and certainly, that doesn't mean we should ignore all the other virulent anti-Semitism that exists. I did this almost as a lark, but it turned out to be very informative. Um, that that it, it confirmed, frankly, my worst fears and, and, and suspicions. That, um, uh, to be blunt about it, the Jewish intelligentsia doesn't have a clue, nor, nor does it seem to want to. And... and, and And it's and it's and it's not as if it's not as if very, uh, you know profound Jewish thinkers from a bygone era uh, haven't noticed this either. Uh, although, as I explain in the book, there's you know a, a lot of a lot of the Muslim apologetic and in, in terms of you know invented uh, utopias, whether they're in in um, Andalusia or in the Ottoman Empire, in fact, come from Jews uh, who who were trying to rewrite history in a way which they thought would teach Europe uh, to be more tolerant uh, of its Jews. And I, and I understand those motivations. And I, and I think, I think you know, they, they're, they're deluded, but, but, but they're understandable. Um, uh, but but uh, it was Maimonides who, who, who pointed out uh, in his epistle to the Jews of Yemen, um, and I'll just read you one very brief segment because I've read you enough, I, I understand that. Um, 
uh, he just says, he's writing, he's writing in response to, uh, he's lived through the, uh, the horrible Almohad persecutions. He, he had to act, behave as a crypto convert to Islam himself. There are, there are poignant descriptions by Ibn Akin, who is a contemporary of, of uh, Ibn Akin, I'm sorry, who is a contemporary of, of, uh, of Maimonides, who writes about the literal inquisition that was waged against the Jews. Even, even Jewish forced converts to Islam who were now second and third generation under the Almohads. Um, this was unrelenting. Uh, and uh, Maimonides, though, in 1172, thereabouts, it's believed, is, it writes his epistle to the Jews of Yemen, and he's responding to a wave of persecutions and forced conversions in Yemen, far-flung Yemen. That it, and, that, and, and Yemen was, as I mentioned, was, was, uh, was uh, a, a, a land where there were no other dhimmi. All the hatred was vented at the Jews, and, and they, were, they were chronically besieged. Um, but, uh, uh, and, and in fact, 90% of the population was exterminated as a result of a forced expulsion in, in 1679 to, six, uh, 1679 to 1680. Um, so he's, he's, he's responding to this plaintive appeal from the Jews of Yemen. And he writes, God has hurled us in the midst of this, of this people, the Arabs, the Muslims, who have persecuted us severely and passed baneful and discriminatory legislation against us. Never did a nation molest, degrade, debase, and hate us as much as they. This is Maimonides. Elsewhere in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, um, a, a, a commentary on the Torah, he makes a very interesting uh, observation, Maimonides, that, that yes, he would, he, would, he would try to share his understanding of Torah with Christians, but he warns, never, never, a, a Jew should never attempt to do that with Muslims because they will take it as, as such an affront, as such a heresy, that, that it could endanger any Jew who would attempt to do such a thing. And, and, and Maimonides was no fan of Christianity. In the same epistle, he, he says very, uh, very uh, uh, hateful things about Jesus and uh, about digging up his grave and shaking around his bones and things. So he's not, he, 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 he's not, a, uh, he's not an apologist in any sense for, for, for Christianity, and he harbors the prejudices of his era. Um, but he does point out in terms of physical danger and, 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 and reasoning, that, that, a, that a Jew should never try and teach his understanding uh, of, of the Torah uh, to, to a Muslim because it involves an issue of safety. Um, so, I, 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 you know, these kinds of understandings uh, have been present for a long time, and I think we need to rediscover them. Thank you very much. Go right ahead. All right. Um, my question is, and what is your answer to this? Uh, during the uh, Inquisition in Spain, can everybody hear me? Yes. 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 I speak rather loud, so it's okay. Here. During the Spanish Inquisition, the Ottoman Empire welcomed Jews into Turkey. What is your answer to that? Yeah. Why? What was uh, that? Well, okay. This is a very. This is actually a very important point. Let me, let me contextualize what happened. Let's go back to what I described, was, was the horrific Almohad persecutions in the 12th and 13th century. Uh, forced conversions, an inquisition of its own, uh, uh, mass killings, etc. cetera. Um, Jews at that time actually sought and received refuge in the Christian controlled areas of Spain and if they, renounced their, if they renounced their forced conversion to Islam, th that is, they were welcomed back as, as, as Jews who could, who could practice their religion, uh, you know, within, within, the, within the prejudicial constraints of, of that era in, in Spain. But certainly a far better situation than what they had experienced with these mass uh, persecutions and pogroms uh, in Almohad controlled parts of both North Africa and, and, and Spain. Um, now, as the Inquisition picks up speed in the 14th uh, and, and 15th centuries, indeed, the, the, the the, the, most of it is forced conversion, 
and the persecutions. Um, really, uh, it's interesting, Bibi Netanyahu's father, uh, Ben Zion, is, is, is one of the great historians of the Inquisition, and, and he along with Henry Kamen. And they point out two important things. First of all, the brutality of the Inquisition was quote unquote successful in that most of the Jews converted. And in fact, crypto, crypto, crypto Judaism was not a pervasive phenomenon. There were, there were Jews who were pious and steadfast in, in their belief. Um, and most of those who were expelled wound up getting safe haven in Europe, in other tolerant parts of Western Europe. A tiny minority, a tiny minority, because uh, at, at some point there are figures that, that the population of the Jews swelled to 500 to 800,000 in, 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 in Christian Spain. 20,000 or less were, were in fact granted, quote unquote, it's not, it's a special status. They were called sergun under the Ottoman Empire, uh, deportation Jews. And with sergun came the restriction that once you were deported to location X, that's where you reside your life under pain of death. And, you were, uh, and, the, and the Sharia was imposed upon you. And what created the vacuum for those Jews? Why were these, why were these areas in need of population slash repopulation? Because the expanding Ottoman conquest, the jihad conquest raised, ra waged by the Ottomans, had decimated not only the Byzant uh, 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 Christian communities, Balkan, Byzantine, etc., but the Jewish communities that had established a modus vivendi wi within those, those areas. And those Jews were slaughtered, taken into the Dev Shemay, the slave soldier system, at least initially, until they were not, I guess, found to be very good soldiers, uh, unlike the Christians. Um, and uh, so you see, it's 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 a it's a it's a it's a process that that is waves of persecution, and uh, it's it's not a black and white situation by any stretch uh, of the imagination. And indeed, uh, the perspective of the Jews that had that had established a modus vivendi under the Byzantines was they they I include a lot of their writings in the book. They saw the Ottoman conquest as a calamity as an absolute calamity, whereas, of course, the, the 20,000 Jews that are arriving from, from the Inquisition, you know, see it, see it as a blessing and, and, and as a liberation. So this is the perspective that's never taught. Uh, that, that these are, it, it, there was a similar uh, thing that I came across um, uh, uh, 500 years or so earlier. There was a horrible uh, uh, wave of persecutions under the Fatimids, who, who as, a Shiite, as, a, as a moderated Shiite sect, were sometimes more tolerant. Uh, but, but there was a particularly uh, fanatical period at the beginning of the 11th century under al-Hakim. Uh, brutal, brutal persecution of Jews in particular, but also Christians. And we see, um, we see uh, Basil II, I believe, in uh, the Byzantine Empire of the time, welcoming Jews into the Byzantine Empire. I mean, so, so Jews will go to areas where they will be tolerated. But in terms of, in terms of, 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 um, of, uh, uh, of, of the Spanish Inquisition, most of the Jews who received safe haven were granted safe haven in other parts of Europe, not in the Ottoman Empire. And I have seen ridiculous figures where it's claimed that, you know, half a million or a million Jews, you know, were given safe haven in the, it's absurd. It's absolutely absurd. Cayman, uh, who, again, who I mentioned is the other great historian of the Inquisition, did some very good demographic analyses, and his conclusion was, was at maximum 20,000 Jews, which is, which is significant. But, you know, the other thing that happened to these Sergun Jews, these deportation Jews, was that as new areas, as the Ottoman Empire expanded, they could be deported once again and, and forced to, to populate additional areas against their will. And, and, and so, and, and, the, and the status of, of Jews chronically under the, in, in the Ottoman Empire, um, I described the situation in Palestine. That's, that was the Ottoman Empire in 1700. That, that was what Gedalia of Shimatsi was writing about. That was Ottoman rule. Now, it was lo also local rule by the, by the Arabs that were under, under the Ottomans. Um, there, there are, the, the, the European travelers in the, in the 18th and even into the 19th century Describe the, the Turkish word that was used to describe Jews. Chifit. It means filthy Jew. Uh, you know, remember the old Robert uh, Klein thing where, you know, he's doing a stereotype of the bigoted southerner 
and he can't separate Jew from Jew bastard. You know, I mean, so it, it's not a Jew, it's a Jew bastard. You know, so, so the, the, chiffet, that's the word, and it means filthy Jew. Uh, so, so the, the, um, the, the, the and, and again, a, a, another one of these myths in terms of Ottoman tolerance was again, and it was Greats actually, uh, Henrik Greats, who, who was also responsible for writing about, uh, in a very hagiographic way, about the experience in Muslim Spain, um, was to, I, again, the motivations are very understandable. He was trying to teach contemporary Germans in the 19th century that you see, uh, you can learn from Islam. Jews were, were part of this uh, uh, civilization. They could be tolerated. They can be integrated into German society as well. And so these myths were invented for, for, that, for that purpose. It's on that story. Yes, all the way in the back. Thank you very much. Um, the untold uh, story right now in the Arab and Muslim world against Christians. And we, it seems to be a taboo subject here. And I was wondering, has uh, any of this A taboo subject here? Hmm? Uh, my, my talk was on, was in, was on Islamic anti-Semitism. No, I mean, it's not like you hear it on CNN. Oh, oh, right. No, but that's different than here. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty taboo here. That, that, you know, it, it's, it's not, it's barely covered. Absolutely. Right. You're absolutely right. You're um, absolutely and right. Then, and then we have you know, the, the Presbyterians and the Episcopalians who are very busy condemning Israel. Have they ever been confronted with the suffering of their fellow Christians? All the time. And, and can you elucidate, can you enlighten on that? Um, you know, it's, uh, it, it, it's, it's uh, uh, where, where do I begin? Um, you know, it, it, there's there, there's there's a there's a third worldism that pervades uh, the Christian left now. Um, there's uh, there's there's uh, the, the the Vatican, which unfortunately, by the way, I hate to tell you all this because uh, there's a new book out by a very courageous Italian journalist where a lot of the progress made in terms of Vatican II is being undone now, unfortunately. Um, but but the um, the, uh, the, the Vatican feels that, that by not emphasizing this persecution, uh, it's perverse to me, but they, they feel that they are uh, uh, protecting uh, the, 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 the trapped Christian populations uh, from, from the, uh, the rancor of, uh, of the Muslims. Um, so there's that motivation. Uh, you know, and, and, of, and of course, you know, getting back to, to the mainstream left churches, etc., uh, in the end, of course, it's all, it's all our fault. It's all, somehow, it's the fault of the West for whatever they did during the colonial period, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There, was, there was harmony. Um, they have their myths about uh, Islamic tolerance of Christians, just the way Jews have their myths about Islamic tolerance of, uh, uh, of Jews. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a mess. Uh, the, 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 all, these, all these threads come together. Uh, the, 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 you didn't mention perhaps the worst tragedy of all, uh, and the most perverse which is that our, our misguided adventure in Iraq, at least the long-term aspect of it, not necessarily getting rid of Saddam, uh, has been accompanied, just like under the British adventure beforehand, with, with what, what may turn out to be the final death knell for the Assyrian Christian population on our watch, just as on the Brits' watch, there, there were massive pogroms uh, in the 1930s against the Assyrian Christian populations. How does one explain that? Um, you know, other other than political expediency, denial, etc., it's 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 a it's a horrific mess. It's a horrific mess. But I mean, again, at the heart of it, to argue simply and clearly, I think there's a denial of how this doctrine, whether it applies to Jews or or, or other non-Muslims has real consequences. It has real consequences. Historical consequences. It's not, it's not a theory, it's a practice. Yes? I have a question about the your view regarding who or what is behind this uh, myth promoting. And I'm, uh, I have a strong view about this. <laughs> and I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with all these parents. Yeah, yeah. There's a new book. Have you seen the new reevaluation of Perrin's theory? Yeah. Yeah, revisited. But the question, my question is why was this suppressed around 1945 or after? 
Oh, I don't know. I mean, there's, again, there's been this sort of cultural self-loathing in the West, uh, you know, since, uh, since the World War I era. Uh, part, of it, part of it is that um, there's, been, there's been political expediency in terms of dealing, you know, how does one deal as a colonial power w with, with, these, with these enormous Muslim societies and all their prejudices, and uh, h how, can you, how can you be protecting, you know, the, the, the minorities when you're trying to get out? Um, you know, has been a long theme. Um, uh, you know, uh, uh, but, but Perrin's theory is, 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 is certainly very straightforward uh, and interesting. Um, but you do raise an interesting, uh, there was actually a very good story um, in the Daily News in 2003, uh, which, uh, which talked about um, materials that came to light. Uh, I think the guy's name was Larry Kohler Estes. Uh, and he, he wrote, he wrote uh, a piece in the, in the Daily News um, about the textbooks that were being used in New York City area Islamic schools. And just to cut to the chase, and, uh, they, they basically were reiterating many of the anti-Semitic motifs which I reviewed for you in, in these textbooks. And, um, oh, I don't know, do, I, I guess you'll consider me perverse, uh, but uh, I had to, uh, I, 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 you, know, you have to take some morbid uh, or morose humor in all this. Um, when, when, when the author of, of, of some of these material was confronted by the Daily News reporter, uh, he, he wasn't in a denial mode at all. He said, well, Islam, like any belief system, believes in I its program is better than others. I don't feel embarrassed to say that. The books are directed to kids in a Muslim educational environment. They must learn and appreciate there are differences between what they have and what other religions teach. It's telling kids that we have our own tradition. And, you know, so... So, but 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 just to just to help you understand, and it, it, it's 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 repetitive in terms of what I presented. But from the report, in Long Island City, Queens, for example, fifth and sixth graders at the ideal Islamic school on 12th Street learned that Allah revealed, and this is Quran 261 3112, that quote the Jews killed their own prophets and disobeyed Allah. Yet a third book in use at the Ideal School describes the hostile relations between Jews and the Muslim prophet Muhammad in Medina in the 7th century. The reasons for Jewish hostility lies in their general characteristics, the book says. Numerous Quranic citations follow with negative references to Jews. For example, you will ever find them deceitful, except for a few of them. This is Quran 371, 446. On Jewish hostility to Islam. The reasons for Jewish hostility toward the Muslims of 7th century Medina lies in their general characteristics described in the Quran. Example, you will find the most implacable of men in their enmity, enmity to the faithful, to the Muslims, are the Jews and pagans. That's Quran 582. This is the verse going all the way back to Jahiz in the middle of the 9th century that he claimed had engendered the, the hatred, the greater hatred of Muslims towards Jews, even though they were powerless relative to Christians, going back to the middle of the 9th century. This is what's still being taught in New York City area schools. Yes. Uh, in your uh, research, have you come across any period during either Muhammad's conquests in which his armies included any multitude of Jews who obviously were forced to convert or willing to convert, and even rose, the Jews rose to the high rank, he had his army? Now, nothing that I'm aware of of any significance. There were very few Jewish converts. That was part of his frustration. There were very, very few Jewish converts. You know, his converts essentially came from the pagan, pagan Arabs. Um, so, uh, his, 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 from the pagan Arabs. From, from, uh, uh, that, that was more of the conquest. But no, no, the, 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 major, the major converts to Islam were the, were the pagan Arabs. Yes, all the way in the back. A <laughs> um, couple of things, and I think, again, this is part of some of the general misconceptions. Um, not to exculpate the Muslim Brotherhood, but, you know, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood is, is a very, very legitimate mainstream uh, interpretation. Their interpretation is very legitimate mainstream interpretation of Islam. 
They, they, are, they are not um, Albana himself, uh, the, the ideologues like uh, Karadawi. Um, the, these are, these are uh, it's inappropriate to call them radical. They, they are mainstream. They, they express a very authentic, uh, modern version of traditional uh, Islam. Um, their, their origins, yeah, there's a, they're, they're, they actually really come more out of a continuum. You know, there were, there were caliphate movements that began in India, much bigger than the Muslim Brotherhood, at the end of the, of the Russo-Turkish War. Um, there were, there were so-called modernists like Al-Afghani at the end of the 19th century and his pupil, Muhammad Abdu, uh, and then of course, uh, Rashid Rida. Who, who, were, who were really uh, in direct line before Albana. In fact, um, Abdu and, uh, and um, Rita put out a publication called Almanar, The Lighthouse, and actually Hezbollah has picked up on this. Um, and uh, it, it went defunct uh, with Rita's death in 1935. And who do you think revitalized it? Albana himself. Uh, so so, so the, the, the Muslim Brotherhood um, is, is, uh, is really a continuum of mainstream um, revivalist movements uh, that, that began uh, in the 19th century. And people could argue there have periodically been these kinds of revivalist movements throughout the history, uh, the turbulent history uh, of Islam. Um, what's, what's, uh, what's also important to realize is that, is that serious Western historians um, have decades ago noticed that the entire modern Muslim discourse is dominated by the thinking and discourse of the Muslim Brotherhood. This, this has been known for, for decades now. Uh, and why is that? Again, because they, they express a very mainstream uh, strain, pious traditional strain uh, of Islam. Now, um, when, they, when they are engaged in all forms of, of uh, uh, you know, we see them emerging as a result of the Arab Spring. Um, it's interesting to then reflect back, uh, you know, again, the, it's the same sort of nonsense that we got into after 9-11 with hijacking and this, the, 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 the Arab Spring was hijacked. It wasn't hijacked. We, we, can, we, we can look at hard polling data. As a matter of fact, uh, the Clinton, one of the Clintons' favorite pollsters and a champion of the Clintons, uh, Doug Schoen, published a very nice, short, concise, interesting piece on the Fox News website uh, about last February. Uh, Mubarak, I believe, had already been deposed or was on his way out by, by the time uh, Doug simply summarized polling data out of Egypt. And uh, in, in February of, 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 20, uh, of 2011, uh, he said, if you look at the sociologic data uh, coming out of Egypt, the Muslim Brotherhood's gonna win in a landslide. You know, so he called the election uh, nine months in advance just from his perspective as a seasoned political pollster. Um, and some of the things he noted, and uh, which had been noted in previous surveys by Pew, et cetera, was, for example, roughly 85% of Egyptians said that uh, those who forsake Islam, who are quote unquote apostates, should be killed. Um, that's 85% of the population. That's the Muslim Brotherhood's agenda. Uh, 73 or so percent uh, agreed with, uh, with mutilating punishments for theft. That's the Sharia. That's what the Muslim Brotherhood says. So, so, so <laughs> because that's the mainstream societal beliefs. It's Orthodox Sharia. That's it. That's, that, that's, that's traditional Islam. <laughs> Nani, please. part and parcel of Islam ideology that it is. And um, so I thank you for that. Another thing about uh, the idea of accusing Jews of killing prophets, of, of killing, uh, trying to kill Muhammad, to poison Muhammad. All of these things are happening until today. Accusations that Jews... Three-year-olds. <laughs> Three-year-olds. No, it's happening about actions of Jews today 
Oh, Arafat, Arafat, yeah, yeah. Right. Never mind that pederasty, but, you know. <laughs> Violating other people's human rights, which you show you. But everybody, this is Noni Darwin. <laughs> <laughs> and and please, everybody, I, I I had the I had the privilege of reading Nani's new book in advance copy, and it's magnificent. I urge everyone to get it. it should be out soon, right? Yeah, next month. And I, I really I really thank you because I learned so much from you. Oh, Even thank you. Well, thank you, thank you. I'm very flattered. He knows more than so many Egyptians, Muslims, and I am just sad that Muslims are not being educated in the Islamic But by, by the way, by the way, the the National Iranian Teachers Exam has a question. Uh, this was I read this in a in a book, um, a wonderful book about uh, an academic book uh, about the plight of minorities in in Iran by uh, a, a, an Iranian Armenian, uh, Elise Sanasarian, who I believe is a, is might still be a professor out here uh, at at one of the uh, California universities, and she points out that that. Uh, uh, Teachers sitting for their certification exam in Iran had to you know, were asked the question, you know, basically who killed Muhammad? Well, the answer is a Jewess. You know, I mean, so that's on the that's on this teacher exam. Not multiple choice. <laughs> I guess there were you know, there were other choices. You know, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu. I don't know, whatever. Yeah. Uh, okay, 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 you know. Yes, yes. Um, based on uh, your research and, and so on. Are the, um, I hate to use the erroneous term Palestinian Arabs, why don't we say the uh, local Arabs in Judea and Samaria um, ever capable of accepting the existence of a Jewish state? I think, I think a tiny minority of extremists might be. <laughs> yeah, one last question. Okay. So the historical uh, context, I think, is really fascinating. The, the historical context, I think, is really you know fascinating. My question is this, which is, what's the way forward? What's your advice on the policy of the U.S. government and people in this room and people in general, given that it's so systemic, uh, the hatred of not only Jews but Christians, but all. So well, you know, it might sound quixotic. Uh, I think, first of all, we have to talk about it. We, we, we have to talk about it. We have to, we, have to, we have to discuss it. We have to discuss it and say how unacceptable it is. Um, you know, we don't, we don't tolerate the hatred of David Duke. Uh, you know, we shouldn't tolerate this hatred. And this is, this is far more pervasive and far more dangerous. And it's not just directed at Jews. I mean, one of the, one of the problems, and, and, you know, of course, I, I kind of fell into this trap as well, but, uh, you know, I, I felt there was a need. Um, but but on, on the one hand, it is important to point out the theological animus. Um, but, but, as, but as going again all the way back to Al-Jahiz, you know, the political can, can at certain times override the theological in one sense. That, that uh, you know, the, 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 so we cannot, we cannot se separate um, the, the, the plight of the Jews from the plight of other non-Muslims. Uh, and this is critically important. And it, was, it, is, it is important to understand, you know, even as the Muslim Brotherhood put it so aphoristically, you know, first the Saturday people, then the Sunday people. Um, the, 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 um, the, the, it is important not to make this so Judeocentric on the one hand, and but, but unfortunately, you know, 
there is this, this core theological animus against Jews, and, they, and their annihilation is, in fact, supposed to usher in the, 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 uh, the, 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 the end of times. So, so there's, a, there's a critical motivation that, that we can't ignore. We have to balance that. Um, and, and I think that um, in, terms of, in terms of sort of you know, geopolitical policy, Oh, we must we must stop these nation-building efforts in uh, you know re rebuilding and remaking Muslim man in our image. I mean, this is just an absurdity. They don't want it. Um, it, 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 it's, it we, we must debase ourselves in the process of doing it. I mean, the rules of engagement that we have for our, our, our troops, uh, the, the fact that uh, we, we are bringing in uh, Muslims to teach our Marines in Afghanistan uh, that they shouldn't be peeing or defecating towards Mecca. Um, you know, this is, this is way, way, way out of hand. Uh, and I think, you know, um, uh, one of the things, obviously, that, that fuels the jihad uh, are, the, are the massive sums of money uh, that, that we, we ex pay out in terms of oil purchases. And, and so energy independence becomes a real critical uh, political instrument um, to, to, to at least at some level defund some of the, some of the jihadism coming our way. Um, but I, but I, think, I, I think it's equally important to deal with acute threats, um, and that's it. I mean, you know, unless, unless we don't have the, I don't think we have, we certainly don't seem to have the will, we may no longer even have the capability to do, for example, um, it's very illuminating to read about what was done with Japan. And I'm not just talking about, you know, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. I'm talking about the aftermath. Um, you can, I include in my new book some of the posters uh, that, that were brought to, brought to my attention um, by a wonderful uh, 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 historian uh, about our program to delegitimize political Shinto in in Japan after World War II, uh, and you know so so we we in, in essence have not have have done the opposite of that in our adventures in Afghanistan and Iraq where we've 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 taken uh you know thrusting uh, uh uh hideous academics like Noah Feldman and had and put him in a position to help them draft sharia based constitutions uh th this is this is this is this is a dangerous absurdity so so we 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 we've, we've capitulated to to promoting you know sh sharia based societies uh, which are going to engender the beliefs that, that I've described here. So I think, you know, the policy has to change towards dealing with acute threats um, and, and getting the hell out, uh, you know, and, and it's, it's, um, it's really been tragic to see how things have ultimately unfolded in, in both uh, Iraq uh, and Afghanistan.